final in round. Um, my name is Amelia. I will be chairing panel B. Uh, you can address me as Madam Chair, Honorable Chair. Uh, maybe all of the judges starting from the right can go around and introduce themselves. I'm Taylor. No preference on me. Dan. Uh, Carlo, no preference, please. Mo, no preference. Ryan, no preference. Uh, great. Uh, can speakers just indicate their order and preferred pronouns? Yep. Do I speak first, Keith? And Danny second to begin. And opening opposition? Uh, Nash is speaking first. She, she they. Uh, yeah. Switch speaking second here, they please. Closing? Um, Which Leon closed. Okay. Closed. Yeah. Um, um, that's no that's preference. Uh, okay. Second, no preference. Um, closing opposition? She first. Michael second, no preference. Great. Uh, without any further ado, then we'll call this down to order. I would like to call upon the Prime Minister to assume the floor and introduce the motion which stands in his name. Thank you. We think on the side of government that there is a problem when Israel claims to speak for the Jewish people, but speaks in a voice that is controlled by a fraction of the Jewish population on this globe, and that is controlled by an unrepresentatively extreme and orthodox faction of that fraction within this country. We think this is a problem that we think we go a long way towards fixing on our side of the house. What is the model? We think it's quite straightforward. About five to ten seats, five to ten percent of the seats within the Knesset are set aside for voting for uh, that, that are elected exclusively by um, by the Jewish diaspora. We think that this is practicing Jews who live across the world. We think that whether or not someone's practicing Jew is quite easy to identify. You just get testimony from a rabbi or something to that extent. We think this is either at a local Israeli embassy that you get this confirmed, or you can mail in your ballot. We also think that the Israeli state should aggressively publicize this internationally through their embassies and so on. That this is something that all Jewish people have the right to do, just as they currently publicize the fact that all Jewish people have the right to return, for example, and become a citizen of this country if they wish to do so. To do so, do kinds of arguments in this, yeah, go ahead. So to be clear, the criteria would be the same as the right of return, is that correct, for Jewishness? So we think it's just like testimony from a local rabbi. That's the testimony, that's the kind of um, uh, thing that we think is necessary to confirm that you're a Jewish person. So the first set of arguments are a principal set of arguments as to why we think it's a requirement of the kind of state that Israel is, that Jewish people living outside of Israel should have a say in what the country's policies are. What are these principal arguments? We think that the idea of Israel is that Israel is the home of Jewish people no matter where they're from, what kind of lives they lead, and so on. This is why this is instituted in the form of the right to return, where you can become a citizen if you wish to do so. But we think a natural extension of this, Madam Speaker, is exactly the fact that if you are if you have the ability to become a citizen of the state naturally at any point, you also ought to have a say in what kind of state it is that you would return to. So what kind of healthcare exists in that place, what kind of, of, of educational policies, what the foreign policy of that state is. We think that is the direct extension of that. But even more, in a more nuanced manner, no thank you, we think the political nation of Israel directly claims to be representative of the Jewish people and claims to represent, for example, the Jewish voice in negotiations in international agreements and so on. So for example, when in the Iran negotiations, Israel claimed to say that the, the deal would be bad for Jewish people overall. What this means is that the actions of Israel directly affect the Question. way, no thank you, that Jewish people identify and the way, even more importantly, that Jewish people are treated by groups within their societies across the world. This is true even if, make note of this, this is true even if they prove to us that Israel doesn't claim to speak for all Jewish people, the way it's perceived across the world means that the actions of Israel uh, directly affect the way that Jewish people are treated overall. We think all of this, no thank you, means that it's incredibly important for Jewish people to have a say in these actions which directly determine their situation. We think that that's an, no thank you, that's a principal reason as to why is, uh, these people should have a say in, 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 in Israel actions. The final thing we think is that um, with the final, we, final thing we think is simply that these that the activities that are happening within these states also directly affect the uh, Jewish diaspora in terms of things like what the criteria for birthright to citizenship even are, like who is allowed to come back and who is not. All of this directly affect the condition oh, ability. No, thank you to have the, the, the ability to act, exercise this right in the first place. We think all of these go to show that even if for some reason they claim that this has bad consequences, there's an a priori obligation for Israel to provide people Jewish people living abroad the right to vote in these elections and influence the policies that it undergoes.
place. But let's, let's say you don't buy that, right? Why do we think that this is a good policy to take from the normative stance? Why it's going to be good for Israel and the world more generally? We think there's two sets of arguments under this okay. closing. Okay. Given that dual citizenship and non-resident citizens exist, why, if you feel so strongly that Israel affects you, can you not opt in to Israeli citizenship? Okay, so we think that there might be other costs associated with dual citizenship. For example, you might live in an area where having an Israeli passport could mark you directly for attacks and anti-Semitism from these people. We think that there are, uh, there are costs associated with getting a passport. We think traveling might be an issue. All of these are reasons as to why we think that Jewish people should still have a much, uh, should still have the ability to um, uh, influence these policies, even if they don't want to take the step of actually becoming citizens. We think that these are, are, are good enough reasons to do that. Secondly, why, so what are, the, what are the ways in which we think that this is good for Israel and the world overall? We think that the status quo in Israeli politics is broken. Netanyahu has a one-seat majority in the Knesset. This one-seat majority only came about because he has this Faustian bargain with far-right and ultra-orthodox parties, such as the Habaya Thari Hayabadi, these ultra-orthodox parties, such as the Shahs and the United Torah Judaism. What this means is that the mainstream parties such as Likud within Israel are dependent on these far-right and extremist parties in order to even go over the day-to-day -day system of governance. This is to show that the 5-10% to 10 of seats in the Knesset will have a big impact on, Israel, on the way that Israeli politics and Israeli policy is decided. This also goes to show that we don't think that the Knesset as it currently stands does voice what or the wide variety of Jewish people within Israel think because the nature of the coalition requires that you have that the ultra-orthodox have an outsized voice within the decision of Wait. policies. No, thank you. Why do we think that this time that the, that the expansion of you know, voting to diaspora Jews goes a long way towards fixing this? We think a couple of things happen as to why this become, why Israel becomes more modern. First, we think the kind of visceral fear mongering about existential threats and nuclear weapons is much harder to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to make to a population that lives farther away. We think this is a good thing because it then requires this, these parties who are trying to contest these seats to rely more on actual arguments as to how these policies come into being and how it affects different parts of the population as opposed to visceral uh, rhetoric. We think this makes for better politics. Second, we think that diaspora Jews are likely to be more moderate because they've interacted more with different kinds of people, not just the Jewish people who live within, within uh, the country of Israel. Recognize that a lot of these people have never even talked to Muslims in their lives. People who live abroad are more likely to have done that. They're also less likely to be super orthodox just because when you're living in a country that's not Israel, it's hard to do things like not use electricity on Sundays or, or, different, or those kinds of policies which are required by ultra-orthodox groups. But finally, we think you just have access to a wider variety of viewpoints and discussions when you're not in a country where the media is suffused by this notion of, in, 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 of the importance of being nationalistic. All of this means that the kinds of parties and people that are being brought into power to fill these seats are likely to be much more moderate. We think this is good because, first of all, it makes the Knesset more representative. We don't think the super right-wing and orthodox are that representative of the status quo. But secondly, we think it's good for the world overall. It makes Israel much more willing to do things like compromise and engage in fruitful discussions towards things like a two-state solution. It means that it's less likely to be aggressively uh, against things like the Iran deal, which on balance is probably good for the world in that it prevents the conflict from exacerbating within this region. At the very least, it means that these people are likely to come to the table in the first place and have discussions as opposed to engage in violence. Incredibly proud to propose. I thank the speaker for his remarks and call upon the leader of the opposition to introduce the case for our bench here. <coughs> opposition today is that the prospect of possibly being impacted by the laws of another country at some point do not necessitate your ability to dictate them under, uh, under the status quo. What we say to you is that it furthermore is not okay for them to be able to impact and greatly, dis uh, and greatly skew the results of politics in a foreign country at the expense of those who actually do have to live under that government. And it's for both of these reasons that we so proudly oppose. Before I get into our three arguments about firstly what merits a right to vote, secondly about the problems with reserved seating, and thirdly about the alternatives that diaspora Jews have under the status quo, let's get into some areas of reputation. So firstly they talked about this principal right that, uh, that the diaspora Jews have in order to uh, vote in, Israeli, uh, in Israel's elections. 
they talk about this idea about how it's simply an extension of the right to return, right? That the end, so because I might return one day to Israel as a Jew, I should have an influence on like the sort of healthcare policy that I'm going to go to. They give us no reason as to why something that might happen in the future, because in the event that you never actually do move back to that country, in the event that you're never going to be influenced by the laws of that country, you shouldn't have a say in that case. But more importantly, is that even if you are going to be impacted by them one day, why then can't they simply opt into citizenship once they actually live there and, under, and undergo the impacts of law on a day-to-day -day basis? That's the reason that people have a vested interest. That's the reason why people get the right to vote in countries in which they reside in. When you leave a country, you, re, uh, you are relinquishing your right to influence that government because you are no longer on a day-to-day -day basis at the mercy of whatever laws that they may pass. We think on that basis alone that this is simply not a principled extension of the right to return. We think that once you return, then you get that right, not something preemptively that might never even come to fruition in the first place. Secondly, they talked about this idea about how this is going to be normatively good, right? They said that Netanyahu is an extremist, uh, has an extremist majority, right? So first of all, they're assuming that the diaspora's views are necessarily going to be so greatly different, right? Yeah. And we already see that that isn't necessarily the case, right? You see a lot of anti-Palestinian sentiment among diaspora Jews across the entire globe. We don't see why this is necessarily going to have the huge impact that the diaspora Jews are not being represented properly on the international state. Because we think even in the smallest sense that they aren't being represented by a country that they don't even fuck reside in, what we think is that in the international stage, whatever country that they do live in, a Jew who lives in the United States or in the United Kingdom gets to influence that government and is able to have their views shared. That's why we think that in the, uh, with regards to Israel particularly, why the, uh, the Western world has such close ties with it, because Jews, with the diaspora Jews are so heavily mobilized and, pol and politically involved in the countries in which they reside. No thank you. So there really is no need for this resolution to come to fruition, but more importantly what we're going to tell you in my uh, constructive materials, why it's so principally inconsistent and damaging uh, to the people who actually live there. Go ahead. Is the diaspora more likely to be invested in Judaism and invested in the country of Israel's politics if they have the ability to vote or not? If they're going to be more moderate? Are they going to be more invested in the country and more involved with it? How much more involved in a country can you be if you don't even live there? Like, what are you going to do other than vote for a government and like wait another like four or five years, I'm not sure how Israel's government actually votes, um, until the next election, right? Like, you just get to say, hey, I influenced them, and then do literally nothing else. Any, of, any law that comes into fruition afterwards, you have no consequence over, right? So you can vote however you want and don't actually feel the real impact of that. We think that's incredibly problematic and actually is very much what I wanted to talk about in my first constructive point, about what merits uh, the right to vote. So we think is that the only reason you should be given a right to vote in a democratic country is because of the fact that you should be able to have a say and an influence on the lawmakers who are going to make rules and guidelines for how you conduct yourself every single day. We think that's why residence is such a key thing because that's how we determine the jurisdiction and that's how we determine um, how, a state, how a person is going to be governed. What we also say is that when you necessarily live there, you have a stake in the society, right? Like you are going to make, you're going to necessarily have to think more rationally and more thoughtfully and more important and uh, like. You just have to go through a better thought process when you have to vote and you're going to be impacted by it, rather than something that you don't really have to have a vested interest in, right? So, that's nece so that doesn't necessarily come into fruition. But more importantly, even if you do have a vested interest and you live abroad, that doesn't necessarily give you a claim to dictate how people in another country are going to live, right? Like, even though I think the entire world would be greatly disadvantaged if Trump wins the next election, we don't necessarily have a right as an international community who might be impacted by his policies one day to vote in that election, right? That's not how voting that's not how uh, democracy works. But more importantly, what we say is that if this is the case, then why aren't you extending this uh, to other people who actually live uh, in Israel, right? Like, why shouldn't the diaspora of Palestinians or Muslims or Arabs have any say in the government uh, whatsoever? We think that's incredibly problematic, especially if you look at the uh, proportion of people who are most harmed within uh, within Israel. And that actually brings me into my second pro uh, constructive point about the problems with reserved seating, right? Because we think is that the only instances, and we're not even necessarily for reserve seating in any situation, but the only instances where you can justify that are to give back to like minorities who have been systematically oppressed within that country, right? Like that's why uh, there's Aboriginal uh, reserve seating within, uh, I think it's New Zealand. It's somewhere. In, it's either New Zealand or Australia, um, and you have the same, uh, and you have that sort of, uh, and you have that sort of uh, affirmative action for these unrepresented groups. We don't think that uh, the diaspora Jews necessarily quantify this in the sense that they are able to vote in a, a 
most likely in a Western liberal democracy, and they are able to uh, uh, vote, and they are able to have their ideas brought to fruition. We don't necessarily see the same uh, systematic oppression that fit, that necessitates reserve seating. But more importantly, what we say is that we're going to see a lot of situations. No, thank you. In which the diaspora Jews views are necessarily going to align with that of the uh, uh, with that of the existing state of Israel, right? Like pro-Israeli uh, interests. So we think that that's necessarily going to be a harmful thing because it undermines the democratic rights of Palestinians within that region. Because when you look at the statistics right now, is that within like the next year, I believe it is, the Palestinian people are going to like, given their population um, uh, 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 is rising, they're going to outnumber the uh, Israeli people, right? So from a democratic standpoint, what they are necessarily going to do, if Israel has to do, is either A, like, relinquish their ability to act solely in like Jewish, pro-Israeli, settlement, Zionist sort of interest, and be able to um, see to the majority of Palestinians, or they're going to have to systematically undermine the ability for Palestinians to get, uh, to get influence within government, right? And that comes through policies like this, when you seek out people who don't even live in the country to be able to influence the election, right? You're just systematically oppressing the Palestinian people, even further trying to discriminate them from the democratic process. We think that's incredibly harmful. Because when Palestinians even have the slightest chance to be involved in a legal process towards bettering the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, and side so government wants to make it so that they never have that option whatsoever, we think that's incredibly harmful and it's only going to lead to greater degrees of conflict and extra legal means by Palestinians try to assert their rights. Lastly, about this idea of alternatives, like I said earlier, you were able to influence your own government in your home country because you're a diaspora Jew and you already see that happening with the relationships the United States has with Israel. It's for all these reasons that we proudly oppose. I thank the speaker for her remarks and call upon the deputy to resume the defense of propositions case here. here. So this morning, Michael told me every time I debate, he thinks I'm going to like pull out a cream cheese bagel. I didn't really know what he means, but I guess now the speech I'll have a bagel and a vote. So <laughs> let's get to it. First thing, democratic representation, dealing with a lot of direct rebuttal we get, but also against new substantive material from the yellow. I think the thing that Druva sets up that we don't really get engagement with, and the reason why a lot of their reputation doesn't apply is we're saying Israel is unique as a state in ways that other governments are not. Two reasons that's the case. The first reason is that it establishes a right of return, which means it's not just like you were someone with a like tangential interest because you're potentially impacted by this, but that the government has staked its identity on this place, that it is a place for Jews around the world to come to. We want to form a Jewish state, and facilitating that right of return is essential. We say because of that, it means these people should have a direct say because it impacts the place they return to. They just say, oh, why should you have an impact on something in the future? I think like people vote for their future selves all the time. Like, for instance, I want liberal nominees on the Supreme Court so they can strike down laws in North Carolina uh, that are like anti-gay, even though like I'm probably not going to live in North Carolina. Like there are still direct reasons why, as a country, or like uh, considering future alternatives is fair. I think people do that all the time, especially when we say we want to make this a place that diaspora Jews can come to. But the second thing, and the thing that I think deals with a lot of their material that they don't engage with, which is that Israel has a monopoly on the collective representation of what it means to be Jewish. This is something that impacts people's narrative of their lives throughout the course of how they live, what they uh, practice as, and when Israel gets to control that, it's problematic because many people are impacted by it, and if they are directly impacted by it, they should have some sort of say over that. That's what differentiates it from just like, you're impacted by the US because Donald Trump is president, because it's not just like, you, because you don't identify as American in the same, if you're in a different country, the same way you identify as Jewish, we say that is important. So what do we get? They say that um, uh, why don't just you why don't you just get dual citizenship? Like I think that might be one way, but it's not the only way that justifies the democratic right to representation. Because we say even if you are not like as invested, given that this directly impacts you and it's something that you are a part of, you should have ownership over that. Then on this idea that. Uh, it, yeah, so why the right of return doesn't apply because like it's not sufficient just because it might happen in the future. Like I think this answers a lot of their new material they introduced about how you shouldn't be able to control the country. Because we're not saying diaspora Jews should be able to dictate everything in Israel. We're saying give them five to ten percent of the Knesset because that is like part of that is like the influence they should have in the sense that they have a minor say in what goes on because it does have some sort of an impact on them. We're not saying just totally make it dominated by foreigners. I don't think they consider the 
the scope of the policy we actually propose. Okay. Do you anticipate that diaspora Jews are going to vote differently from Jews across the world? Or sorry, uh, in Jews within Israel? I think they are like there to vote in line with the about half of the population that votes for more moderate or more center parties. And I'll explain why now. So second thing I'm talking about is the impact on Israeli policy, particularly towards Arabs. So first, just keep in mind uh, two things Druva sets up. First, that Netanyahu is currently in control in a coalition with the far right, and the reason he's able to do this is because he's able to fearmonger, and he's also be able to able to campaign on things like, I'm never going to create a Palestinian state. Why is this inherent problem they have to deal with on their side of the house, and is likely the path that Israel is continuing to go? Because I think when you're in constant conflict and opposition, and there's constant propaganda from the state, you're likely to believe that it's much more existential than when you're outside of the situation. Now what they say is why do we change so yeah, why do we change this? Because they say there's no indication that they're actually gonna vote any differently. But like recognize that if it's like only a one seat majority, like I just we just have to win the plausible claim that more diaspora Jews are probably a bit more moderate than they are radical right wing support or right wing support for Netanyahu. And the reason I think that's reasonable is that they're not likely to be persuaded by fear mongering if they live in the same environment, and also just because they interact with other concerns, so they're probably more exposed to concerns of like human rights accountability, etc., which means they can vote accordingly. I also think this answers their stuff about dual citizenship and why if you're so invested, just get dual citizenship, because the only people who are likely to do that are the people, the zealots they talk about, that are so aggressively pro-Israel and don't account for representation or don't care about other concerns concerns like accounts for the Arabs. What is the impact of this? I think, idealistically, it increases the chance you get a government in place that's at least open to the idea of a two-state solution. That's incredibly important because it answers a lot of the material we get from opening opposition about how we want to account for marginalized minorities because probably the best and most realistic way is not a place in the Israeli government where they're going to be continually oppressed by the right wing, but establishing a state of their own. I think we do get a meaningful chance at peace. But even if we can't claim a two-state solution, because that is very different uh, difficult diplomatically, I do think you at least get a moderate, moderating voice, that there's less likely to be war crimes against uh, Arabs and Palestinians in occupied territories because your government's like there to be in favor of things like human rights. That stops the oppression that they actually talk about because what they say is that like we need to account for the fact that certain people are oppressed in Israel. We're the only side giving you an actual mechanism to do that. I think that is a clear, tangible impact. Uh, um, third thing I'm going to talk about is how this impacts uh, diaspora Jews and then just some reputation. So I think the important thing and the thing they mentioned is that not everyone is equally invested in Israel and before that yet. How much do you really think the policies of the state of Israel change the daily anti-Semitism that diaspora Jews have to face? Wait, what? How much do you think the policies of the state of Israel really influence the anti-Semitism that diaspora Jews face every day and have faced every day Sure, for I think there's years. a tangible impact, especially because Israel's like highly politically contentious in its decisions yeah, people yeah. connected to. Obviously it's not all of it, but it does have an impact on it. It's also just claiming to represent Judaism. So impact on diaspora Jews. Just recognize that not everyone's equally invested, as they point out, that there are certain like high profile people that are a lot more involved. I think when you give people the option of registering to vote and becoming important, you make a lot more Jews around the world, even if they don't necessarily I, I agree fully with the uh, like Zionist principle, that they become a stakeholder in the state, which encourages them to be more involved, hold their government actually accountable to create force against this. So I think it changes the nature of how international action actually occurs. But then finally, just on this last bit of reputation about we should only reserve seats if it's for marginalized minorities. I don't think that's true because of the material we give you about how they're still impacted in a way, and it's still this idea of a right of return that doesn't necessarily apply in other cases. But I also think it's also unclear like whether they're saying we should do this instead. Obviously, that'd be a terrible idea because it would mobilize the right wing in Israel the same way it has again and again and again. Like the idea that Palestinians are taking over. But also, I think the best solution is encouraging two states and encouraging police, uh, uh, peace, we best do that. I thank the speaker for his remarks and call upon the uh, deputy leader to conclude the front half of this round of debate here. here.
Honorable Chair, the view that you get from the opening government is it is good for diaspora Jews to vote in Israeli elections because they might be moderate without telling us what views and issues they're going to be moderate on or why they're going to be moderate in the first place. But they're going to be moderate and they won't be assholes. So their concern is for people, for example, like the Palestinians or minorities within Israel and around Israel. At the point that is true, Nazareth's analysis becomes all the more true, because you create an artificial majority that is literally going to be voting against the Palestinians that reside within Israel itself. There are far more Palestinians that reside in Israel than the diaspora Jews that will be voting against them. I think you are likely to not be able to get the goals that they want on OC. A couple of things I want to do. First of all, deconstruct everything you hear from the proposition, then do some reconstruction. First of all, they tell you that Jews outside of Israel should have the right to vote. They tried to bring up the right to return and said that this was simply an extension of that. Three responses. First of all, just because the right to return exists does not entail that you have the right to vote. Why? Nasser gives you the first analysis here, that in many cases there's no guarantee that these particular individuals generally have a vested interest in ever returning back in the first place. But second of all, I feel like this is fairly analogous to, for example, me seeing a foreseeable future in the United States because I want to be a lawyer there and thinking that, yeah, I should be able to vote because I'm just going to be there in the future. That's absolutely ridiculous. But third of all, the reason that's ridiculous is because laws have jurisdiction. And the laws that Israel passed have jurisdiction within their area specifically. What does that mean? It means that I am a Jew within Israel. The laws passed in that country directly impact me and I do not have an option to not abide by them. If I am a Jew outside of Israel though, I do have that option to not abide by the policies that the Israeli government passes. That means that there is a greater vested interest that people within Israel have towards the policies that are passed by their particular parliament. And that's why we think we have to put greater emphasis on these particular individuals than the individuals that proposition wants to help. Then they told you that, look, Israel claims to represent all Jews and their policies affect Jews all over the world. First of all, arguably, American foreign policy affects people all around the world, but I don't think we allow all people around the world to vote in American elections, right? We think just because policies and laws directly impact people across the world is not a reason directly to give them the right to vote. But secondly, if these people are so passionate, why not return? Why not grant them yeah, citizenship? Yeah. Why not even pursue any of the alternatives that Nazareth tells you, which they conveniently ignore in their first government speech? More importantly, the response you get from this is only the people who will be so pro-Israel would ever go back and get citizenship. Honestly, if you are a Jew who wants to vote in the elections within Israel, I think you are probably going to be pro-Israel. At the point where proposition does no work to show any analysis on why these moderate views are ever going to exist, I don't see that as the case, especially when you consider that anti-Palestinian sentiment, for example, is something shared all across the world by all Jews. So if they want to tell me exactly why it's going to be different, that would be great. No thanks. Then they told you, look, Nadine Yahoo has a marginal lead in representation over other parties. So the question really becomes, and this is why I asked POI specifically, does OG believe that their vote will differ starkly from the majority of Jews in Israel? If the answer is no, this resolution is absolutely useless. And we think that's actually very likely, given the fact that Nasser tells you that things like anti-Palestinian sentiment is something that is shared by Jews across the world, and that this resolution is absolutely useless. They need to tell you what specific issues are diaspora Jews going to vote upon differently and not have that particular same ramification. But let's just say they did. Let's say they magically told you three or four issues that they're going to vote differently on. If that's the question, I don't see how their policy then is effective in any way. Why? Because they told you that you're essentially going to be able to mobilize the right wing of these particular individual of the, of the politics within Israel if you, for example, give credence to the Palestinians there. Yes, you are likely to also mobilize the right wing of the Israeli political arena if you are likely to give vote to people that are voting directly against their interests, right? That mobilization will also occur on their side, and it is likely to have horrible ramifications on the people there. 
More importantly though, they tell you the media is playing a big influence between people there. I don't think they can have it both ways then, right? They can't have it both ways and say the media has a huge influence on people there, but no, there's like 50% of the population that is super moderate and ready to listen to your view. They can't have it both ways and you need to be able to be very realistic in this bit. Go for it. As a Jewish person, I might not want to exercise my right to return because of fear of anti-Semitism or not want to endorse the Zionist belief. Why then, if I'm directly impacted by the actions of a Israel as a Jew, am I not allowed to still vote in these? Because the problems of anti-Semitism that occur in your nation are not automatically going to be solved when you vote in the Israeli elections. If you do want to solve that issue of anti-Semitism, a far more likely alternative that Nazar gives you is to vote in your own country, or actually try to incentivize your own government to make that particular change. More importantly though, we think other parties, the parties they label other than Nate and Yahoo party, will not have the political incentive to now cater to these 5% or 10% people. Why? Because at the point where a majority of Jews believe that their actions, or sorry, their, like, what policies they want to see are actively being violated by people outside, it will be unpopular for parties within Israel to cater to that view. You're likely then, even if they are moderate views, to never get that moderate view coming in within the system in the long run. The last thing they told you is the impact is probably going to be a two-state solution or better engagement, right? That's a far-fetched thing to actually assume, given that a majority of Jews do not want to have a two-state solution. So that parties that actually have the political incentive to cater to the 90 to 95% of people in Israel will never agree to that particular resolution or that particular movement. That's why 5% to 10% in many cases is just blatantly ineffective to getting any of the change that they want to see. For for all of those reasons, very, very proud to oppose. Thank you. I thank the speaker for his remarks and call upon the member of government to extend the case for Proposition Bench. Thank you. Facts matter in debating. And the fact of the matter is, we are not talking about a small community. Let's, let me give you a statistical analysis so that we know what numbers we're talking about, because data does matter in debating, even though we sometimes act like it doesn't. The Israeli population is about 7.6 million people. Of that 7.6 million people, you've got about 1.7 million people who are Arab Israelis. They're Arab Israelis, they're Israeli citizens. But the diaspora community, the, the America has the second largest Jewish community in the world, and that's over two million Jews who reside within America. America is also disproportionately the largest reason why Israel continues to exist. But there are other communities as well where there are large Jewish populations, such as South Africa, where you have over 100,000 Jews who reside in South Africa. And there are states where dual citizenship is not permitted in those particular states. So you can't just have two passports like closing would have you believe through their pure eyes. So that factual basis is important because it refutes some of the implicit assumptions that have been banded around as if they're argument in this particular debate. Now, to respond to the first point of refutation, well, why don't we do this in, with America? Why don't we do this with other places where we've got a large impact? We say we're not opposed to having more people who are adversely affected by big states have a say in what happens in those states. We think if the rest of the world could proportionally vote in American elections, perhaps we wouldn't have all of the problems that have been created by, by America. 
Just saying that's not the way we do things around here is not an argument because we needed to hear analysis as to why the way we do things around here is particularly the right way to do things. Opening, I'm not going to take you because you didn't take me and I think it's fair. All right, Michael. Okay, if you get a vote because you can go to a country, I can go to any country in the EU. So do you think it's fair that I get as much of a say of what happens in Romania as a Romanian who has to live with that reality sure. every single day? As a Jew, you should know that that's particularly not the case with Israel. Because Israeli identity is not the same as Michael hopping around Europe. Israeli identity, first and foremost, is premised on the fact that everybody who was removed violently or otherwise from Israel has a right to return to Israel. So, the state of Israel, you Ben-Gurion and Zionism does recognize every Jewish person as having a legitimate claim to Israeli statehood, right? But further than that, what we tell you is a lot of the people who aren't in Israel, right, aren't there because they are impeded by financial conditions or by the fact that they are structurally attached to environments that they can't simply leave. So it's not that simple for a South African Jew to just pack up and go to Israel because they don't, may not have a form of income there, their law degree may not be realized there, their particular qualifications or unique skills in that particular community may not be recognized there. So it's not the greatest form of argumentation to simply say there are other the ways of doing this. What we have to consider is the people who are precluded by the unique conditions of their geographical locations, why ought they not to have this manifest right to participate in the state that they themselves identify with and that identifies with them even though they're in outposts? That's why they have the right of return. It's at a principal level that they have this right of return. But further than this, right, we believe, and this is our extension, sit down for now, Hashish, I'll take you later. This is our extension, right? And we want it to be crystal clear. And please, give us like an ear. I know it's a Shishan Michael coming up later, but <laughs> this is important, right? What we tell you is that the state of Israel ought to maximize its own benefits. And we put to you that allowing diasporas to vote actually entrenches Israeli interests and benefits. So if you want to maintain a Jewish state, we put it to you as our principal submission that what? this is the way to do it. And I'll tell you why. The Jewish state depends, its very existence depends on the continued existence of lobby groups and special interests who advocate for it within powerful states, right? So if not for APAC, we would not continue to have an Israel because American politicians aren't as beholden to Israel as they sometimes pretend to be. They are beholden to APEC because APEC has a large number of wealthy donors which all parties would like to get donations from. Now, giving more Jewish people more stakes in Israel, more of a direct interest, their knowing that they participate in the decision-making process entrenches their support for Israel within those particular outposts. So, when you have a state like South Africa, which currently supports the, the boycotting of Israel and doesn't recognize the Israeli right to existence, when you have the South African Jewish community with this 100,000 Jews and disproportionate amount of wealth taking part, I said I'll take Ashish, sit down. When, when you have them um, participating and giving disproportionate amount of views, um, what that does is it continues the state support of Israel. So when votes are being made at the United Nations, when states are attacking Israel and requesting that its flag not be put up and that they be de-recognized in many spaces, the people who are going to maintain the pressure at the local level for states to continue to support Israel are the people who have a vested interest in it. Go for it. Can you tell me why APAC actually supports Israel, or whether it supports a certain vision of a certain kind of Israel, which mostly benefits weapons companies? Look, we don't care. We, we, we say to you that this, this narrative is false. APAC is a Jewish community vote. They support Israel predominantly because they are Zionists, and they recognize the right of the Israeli people to have a Jewish state. We think that's empirical. That's in their founding documents. It's on their website. Don't try to fabricate arguments. Now, what we say to you is not only do you have APEC, you have even more lobby groups being created which are pro-Israel under our model. Because now what you've given me is a, a direct stake in Israel. 
because they admit that my voting in, 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 the, in the process makes me a more active uh, participant for that state. And we think that the kind of people who vote are the kind of people who care in the day-to-day -day goings of Israel. And those kinds of people are going to be the kinds of people who act in their outpost communities to protect the continued existence of Israel. Now this matters particularly because global sentiment is actually souring against Israel. What we've seen is that there's been an increased number of votes against the statehood of Israel. And Israel, as it is right now, is losing public sentiment. And if they want to continue to maintain a Jewish state, they need to get all hands on deck, including the people who live in the diaspora, because they already recognize them as being Israeli, or proud to propose. To Thank you. Thank you. I thank the speaker for his remarks and call upon the member of opposition to deliver his seven minute address. Thank you. Four areas in which I'm going to extend everything to integrated. Firstly, what's the characterization of the diaspora that actually is true? We can give you logical reasons for why the characterization we have of them is mostly moderate, it's false. Secondly, on what basis do we give up citizens? Or do we give people the right to vote? Thirdly, why is the case that this policy makes it impossible for us to work towards a two-state solution? And lastly, why is it that the diaspora is informationally not well-placed to make decisions on behalf of actual Jewish citizens? So firstly, let's look at the characterization of the diaspora. We first hear from opening in the claim which is hugely at tension with closing, saying that APAC represents the Jewish diaspora, that most of the Jewish diaspora is relatively moderate and left-wing. Couple of problems. Number one, you are generalizing about the relatively left-wing Jewish community in the US to try and say it's about the entire world, right? That's not the case in Europe. In Europe, the legacy of anti-Semitism yeah, yeah. is still extremely strong. You see synagogues in Britain still being burnt down. You see in Hungary a political party in power that's explicitly running on an anti-Semitic platform. The Jewish diaspora in Europe, the world's largest Jewish diaspora, therefore feels very acutely the idea that they are under siege from the rest of the world. And the message coming up from Naftali Bennett and the Israeli right-wingers that we are under siege, we need to do anything to protect ourselves, is one which they can very easily find. Also, marry that to the fact that the people who are most likely to vote in these elections are probably not going to be the very left-wing Jews, right? Because most of them often do not feel the same kind of intrinsic tribal affinity to the identity of the state. So very often people who do feel the tribal affinity and therefore do feel under siege, who will be casting this vote. Now what about APAC? We say APAC is not the Jewish community. It's bizarre to take one specific lobby group to say that represents the Jewish community. APAC's interest is in keeping Israel as close as possible to a perpetual state of almost quiet but not really war with the Palestinians so that the groups which fund APAC, like weapons companies like Northrop Grumman, can make as much profit as they possibly can. If you're going to tell me that APAC, the CDU told me that APAC is objectively good for Israel, when maybe a more left-wing idea of what it, uh, Israel ought to be about, like more quickly walking towards a two-state solution, might be genuinely in the best interest of that country in the very long run. So it's not at all the case that lobby groups like them are responsible, no thank you, for the survival of Israel. We tell you in many instances, quite the exact Opposite. So we do not think that characterization is bad. So consequentially, you might get a lot more tribal identifications in Israeli politics, especially when the basis upon which you gave them the vote was that they were Jewish. What does that say about the nature of your state? What does that say about how you're going to treat the 1.6 Arab Israelis within your state, yeah. right? So that's my first point. They got that wrong. Secondly, let's talk about the basis upon which we give people the vote. Notice that all the rhetoric about how Israel like, is a home for the Jews and claims to speak for all the Jews buys into what the Israeli government is claiming. That's what it claims. Whether or not that's actually true surely depends on what the diaspora does, right? No, thank you. So presumably, even if the Israeli state says, like, we are your home, we came to speak for you, if you have an option to become a citizen but choose not to, very often, that's because you do not feel like you're part of the Israeli state, you don't want to be associated with that body politic. They try and get around this off by just by saying, well, often there are costs associated to it. Firstly, I think that's a very marginal comparison when you are giving these people the vote, right? At the point it costs you actually becoming a citizen, it's marginal when you're really giving them the chance to vote in that election. No, thank you. And it is just true, guys, that outside countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, where there's a lot of like anti-Semitism, actually, most people who don't want to become Israeli citizens just generally don't really feel particularly yeah, yeah. Israeli. People like Michael or many of the relatively well-off Jewish communities in America or in the, or in the UK, right? So, 
the Israeli state claims to speak for them, but they clearly don't buy into it. So clearly, for them, the Israeli state's claims are false. So a lot of the equivalences you are drawing clearly do not hold for them. Okay, kill them. If there are a lot of Jews like Michael who don't care in the state, don't you think that makes it particularly more important for the state to continue to show up international support from the Jews who matter and still care by allowing them to vote? No, because they might well vote in a way which doesn't reflect your interests, or they might not care and cast a random vote because they are just not that fast most of the time, right? So clearly, the state does not actually care that much, or they don't buy that identity. So what is the basis, therefore, upon which for which we give people the vote, right? We say the vote, no thank you, gives you vast power. You get to dictate policy which affects every other person in that country to justify what will otherwise be a crazy imposition of power of you know, of your power on other people, we need to say that you are the one who's most directly affected in the most real and visceral way. Israeli citizens are conscripted by the state. They are educated by the state. Every military action the state takes might literally mean they die. Economic policies, water policy affects them in a way it just does not affect the Israeli diaspora. But it's unfair to give the Israeli diaspora the same vote when that vote looks the same on paper to Israeli politicians and let them dictate the lives of Israeli citizens who are going to be totalized by those policies when they don't have to bear any of those costs, right? So I tell you, it's principally unfair that you're giving them the vote on this particular basis. So let's talk about why you're going to make the two-state solution effectively impossible to pursue for a long time. we tell you, one of the biggest factors pushing in favor of a two-state solution is the fact, I'll take opening in a moment, that the Arab-Israeli population is growing way faster than the Israeli population. By 2035, they will actually outnumber the Jewish people in yeah, the yeah. state of Israel itself. That makes the incentive to push for a two-state solution absolutely urgent. Yes. Your analysis about why the principle of the vote is being undermined would be true if we allow Jewish people to vote, Jewish diaspora to vote in all the seats. We're giving them 5-10% to of the vote because we think that they are have that much of a stake in this race. You first claim that a small number of extreme parties will disproportionate their power in Israeli Knesset. See, for instance, the, you know, having the Levy Men's Party, right? And now you say that actually 5% of it doesn't make that much of a difference. Either your analysis about why the right wing parties, despite having a small number of vote, are like vote changing political parties, is correct, or you just contradicted yourself in a big way. So, let's talk about why you make it impossible. Because if it is true that the Israeli diaspora disproportionately disfavors a two state solution because they tend to associate more tribally with the interests of that state, you make a two-state solution impossible because now you've introduced a huge number of votes into the country which are going to outweigh the interests of an Arab-Israeli population that already is discriminated when it comes to employment and education and religious rights. They are actual citizens whose views are now being outweighed by the fact that you give other people that view and that makes the possibility of a two-state solution impossible, right? And the two-state solution is something which we concede is not going to happen like overnight because of the way right, of how right-wing the politics is right now. But we say that right-wing politics right now is a reflection of the anxiety about that growing population and it's not sustainable. So lastly, basically, information. Why are people not particularly well placed? The reason is because if you live in another state, political discourse in your country is dominated by your own domestic affairs, right? That means often your views on Israel are formed as a function of your own domestic politics. See, Democrats, you know, support two-state solution, Republicans are a bit more hawkish about these things. So most people who vote on these things will not be voting on a basis of well-considered views based on the media which are consumed from both sides. They're in separate media bubbles formed by, you know, left-wing or right-wing media outlets, and that's how they will vote. It's unclear to me why an Israeli person who consumes a vast amount of media because they live in that country from all sides of the political spectrum is in a worse or uh, is in an equally informationally, you know, intelligent position as a person who does not have access to this information. And for all these reasons, I'm extremely proud to oppose it. I thank the speaker uh, for his remarks and call upon the uh, proposition to conclude the speeches on site government today. Thank you. and who have no social capital and will not be able to get a two-state system. 
So I'm going to deal uh, contextually with the last question, whether or not this policy means that we create this one Israel state, Israeli state that is pretty much dominant and that doesn't want a two-state solution. And the answer to this is that no. The reason for this is largely the Israeli government and the politicians who try and make bilateral agreements are individuals who have publicly voiced out that they want a two-state agreement. Yeah, yeah. They are individuals who have continuously said they've tried to have roundtable conversations, but there are other things that prevent those conversations from happening. When the ambassador of Israel was in South Africa and we met him two weeks ago, he actively said he is for two-state uh, 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 a two-state solution, and he. he wants once that happens, but there are negotiations that are being stopped. Now the question is, who is stopping the negotiations if the politicians that are powerful from the Israel side are the ones that are gunning for the division of a two-state? Now the answer to that, it's people, it, 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 it's groups like Hamas and governments like Hamas and groups that still have attachments to, God, to the Gaza Strips and other parts of the land. So saying that, which is a large part of um, the closing of opposition's case, saying that having a stronger uh, Israel or a stronger state called Israel means that we can never have a two state is a lie because a stronger Israel is current as an Israel is currently gunning for a two state system and would argue even if they were stronger they would still gun for a two state system yeah, yeah. because they've lost so many lives and there's been so much collateral damage right that they've faced yeah. so regardless of whether or not they're strong or moderately strong they don't tell us why they still wouldn't take the stance of negotiating for a two-state a two-state system, which largely deals with the Palestinian people that are vulnerable, which they think we can't protect, right? And then um, the second idea is what's best for the state, and this is where largely our extension comes from, right? We tell you that um, for a young state like Israel, maintaining your statehood and uh, 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 continued assurance that you're a proper state and you're not a failed state in the international community means that you need to get the approval of the big countries, right? Countries ha that have the most influence and that hold the most social capital within institutions like the UN and the United Security Council. And we tell you how implementing this policy particularly achieves this for the country. But let's go into a, a little bit of rebuttal, right? So the first thing that we get here is that uh, the first speaker or opening government says, well, you're the opening opposition says that, well, you're going to damage the people, uh, the lives of the people that live in these countries by giving these foreigners or these diasporas the right to vote. And we'd say we have two responses to this. We told you that because of the religious attachments that uh, Jewish people have to Israel, right, as a country and certain parts of Israel, they're almost assured to return to that country, right? So it's not just a country. And again, it's not just, it's just a country that's geographically set out. It is a country that's geographically set out with, with religious importance. This religious importance is one that a lot of Jewish people have a, have a lot of attachment to. So they have an invested interest to maintain the sustainability and the good governance of that state, right? Because they have a religious, but more than a religious uh, investment in that state. But secondly, they're most likely to return. But we tell you that even in, in instances where uh, they leave the country. That's not proof that they don't want to stay in the country. That's just proof that they immigrate for financial stability in other places, right? And they want to accumulate wealth in other places. So them leaving doesn't mean they were never interested in the state or they didn't care. It's because they were forced by circumstances. So we can't just say, because you're no longer in Israel, you don't care about Israel. We argue that's a lie. But the last extension in that point is that some people have families in Israel, right? Some people still have loved ones in Israel in which policy affects those loved ones, so you're most likely to make decisions that better the health care and the education system for your loved ones that are back in Hamisa. Now, can you give the principle that the right to vote stems from the fact that in Israel, Jews do not have the option to not abide by the policies passed there. Diaspora Jews, though, do have the option to not abide by the policies that the... Uh, yes, uh, uh, so at, at the present moment, they do, right? But in the future tense, where they are intending to go back because of the religious attachment and the ability to go back because of the right to return, you're most likely to be bound by the laws that the politician that you did or did not vote for implements. So in futuristic terms, like our opening said, 
uh, you're more bound to make a, to, to, to be bound by the laws in that country and you don't see why you shouldn't make a decision for the future of that country if you're going to live in it because like they said I might not live in the state uh, or in South Africa now but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't have a say in how it runs especially if my family is there or if I'm certain you're going to return there for religious reasons or other reasons right so that deals with the uh, the principle uh, 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 um, allocation of votes right the second biggest point in the debate then becomes about the moderate views and whether or not we'll get people that are moderate and if yes why not uh, and if not why is that why is that bad so what we get from um, the the speaker from the last um, the last speaker is that well you have a lot of people that are radical Jews right or anti-Semitic Jews that are in Europe, right? But what he does then is that he only identifies a part of the larger diaspora that could be in South Africa that are very liberal, right? Or that could be in America that are quite liberal and still want to see a much more liberal stance in that country, right? Because they've interacted with other identities and because they've interacted with other identities, they understand coexistence better than the Muda, the Jew that is consistently living in that country and doesn't see another view. Right. So at most the debate should then be about the state preserving itself in the international community and the state maximizing its benefits, right? And we argue you only achieve that when you allow people that are in big states to lobby for you. And the only reason why they lobby for you is if they think they have an invested say in how that country is ran and how that com the country is governed. And when you don't use these lobbyists or these people that are in these countries, you have less of a voice in bigger states. States, which means when it comes to voting you out in certain things or voting out, uh, voting whether or not we do recognize your statehood or reverse it if that's even possible, you have less of a, 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 a persuaded vote from the big states and we argue this is bad because states always have to act in their best interest. Right? So because we told you this is in the best interest for lobby groups in the in big states, and secondly because it is not the Israelis that are against a, a two-state system, we argue it still works for the Palestinians and it still works for Israel as I thank the speaker for remarks and call upon the opposition to conclude uh, this final in-round of debate. Thank you.